models, most of which comes from the bubble chamber era, talk a little bit about the models that are implemented in generators with a, a particular focus on the one that's in Genie uh, that I know best. And then from there, move into a discussion of hadronization and nuclei. Again, talking a little bit about the models that are in the generators and the data that we can use to, um, to try to understand uh, how well they're doing. OK, so uh, the first thing I should say by way of just kind of orienting ourselves is we're moving up in energy from what we were talking about a few days ago when we were talking about hadrons. And we were talking about hadronic systems as feed down into measurements at T decay and mini boon, for instance. So we're really we're pushing up in energy. We're pushing up into this few GeV range, uh, the energy range and the oscillation uh, analyses that are going to be done by experiments like NOVA and that have been done by MINOS and then, and then uh, by LBNE. and uh, So keep that in mind. That influences a lot of what we're going to be talking about here um, as, we, uh, as we go forward. OK, so hadronization. So why, why we as experimentalists, why we care? OK, so, uh, so you probably already, if you were paying attention the first uh, you know, couple days, you probably already got a sense of this. But as an experimentalist, I just wanted to tell you, you know, we don't like hadrons either. Okay? You know, we were hearing about how hard they are, how hard it is to calculate hadronic systems. If we could live without hadrons and using them in our analyses, trust me, we would. Hadrons are just a hell of a lot harder to do anything with than the leptonic part of these events. Um, so whether you're talking about low energies or higher energies, uh, detectors respond differently to the various kinds of particles that are going to be present in a hadronic system, the low energy protons, the neutrons. Uh, even when you get into the pion uh, content, for any particular detector, there's a, uh, a quantity that uh, in the experimental community is called the E to H ratio. It's sort of how differently does your detector respond to the electromagnetic uh, component to, to a, than to a hadronic component. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. And then often you have a lot of neutrons in your events that you may, your detector may not even see at all. Okay? So just there's a lot more going on in the hadronic part of the event. Um, it's sort of well known for, for basically those reasons that hadronic calorimetry is much more challenging than just simply trying to measure the lepton energy. Measuring a muon energy or measuring uh, electron energy through electromagnetic calorimetry uh, in terms of just the, the, the statistical nature of it uh, is, is a much more uh, simple game than it is to, uh, to, be, to be trying to measure the hadronic system. Um, even when we talk about our highest resolution devices, liquid argon, things like that, um, it's really difficult to figure out what's going on in the hadronic systems. It can be quite complicated. Particle identification can be challenging. Um, and even you know, once the hadrons you know, get out of that nucleus, you know, there are more nuclei that they're going to face. You know, their life isn't over yet. You're going to have uh, hadronic interactions in the detector, and there are uncertainties in that part of the simulation as well. Okay? So hadrons are just hard. It's one of the reasons that for most of the experiments that are operating in these energy ranges, we do dedicated test beam runs exposing you know, small versions of our, of our detector uh, to hadron beams of various energies to really try to get a sense uh, and some measurements about how the detector is going to perform. Uh, for different hadronic particles of different, uh, of different energies. So a, a common theme in a lot of what we do is trying to come up with analysis strategies that minimize, particularly for oscillation analyses, our dependence on the hadronic system. Uh, you've already seen a, a, a lot of that already at lower energies, and we do the same thing up at some higher energies. But you know, we, have, we have an additional constraint is that you know, we have information in our detector about the hadronic systems. We're trying to get as much information out of our apparatus and out of our data as we can. Uh, so we really do need to make use of it. And when we're talking about neutrino interactions you know, at, at, at few GeV, if you think of that flat Y distribution, you know, on average, half of the energy is in the hadronic system. So you know, we don't have a choice. We have to go there. Uh, we have to try to make, uh, make use of that information. So when I was kind of ruminating on the questions that were being raised by the theorists, I was trying to think of how I would give a pithy um, explanation about why hadrons are important, and I couldn't. Okay? It's very much. It's very much a, a, a question that comes down to the specifics. You really have to focus on a particular experiment, their detector, their beam, their physics. Okay? So uh, I can't really make general statements other than a, a few very, very broad things, which is that it depends, as I said, on, on, on the beam, and in particular if you're talking about a narrow band beam or a wide band beam. Um, and then if we think about all the different kinds of analyses they, that we're doing, uh, hadrons typically come in in, in one and or two, two ways. One is where we're using some information about the hadronic system to classify the events. Okay? So maybe we want to do something like a, a QE uh, reconstruction with a, a, a you know, QE hypothesis using just the muon 
uh, energy and direction to be able to um, uh, to be able to reconstruct the Q squared and the neutrino energy. Well, we need to, you know, make a decision about whether or not there was hadronic stuff in the event before we can do that. Uh, we don't directly use that hadronic system and then in measuring the, the energy in the Q squared, but we do use it for classification. So that's, that's a, a very common uh, use that we can't get around. Um, and then uh, also fairly uh, often, in particular, once we're up in these sort of higher energies of NOVA, NOVA LB&E, uh, et cetera, you know, we do need to measure something about the hadronic event. And, uh, or sort of the hadronic part of the event. And then we can sort of categorize the things that we do in, in two uh, broad ways. One is that we don't really care about the, the particles in the event. We just measure a, a whole bunch of energy that came from the hadrons. And we're trying to sort of sum it up with calorimetry um, and make an energy estimate based on that. Or we might have a, a, a more sensitive device. And we can actually look within the hadronic part of the event to identify protons, pions, et cetera, and try to do some physics with the individual particles that we find within the hadronic shower. And obviously, that, that gets quite a bit more challenging. Um, so I think, I think this is sort of what I just said. It's you know, the, the, the theme of the, uh, the workshop here is to talk about oscillation experiments and the needs of oscillation experiments. Um, and as I said, it's hard to make sort of general statements, in particular because when we talk about oscillation experiments, you know, we're, we're studying a lot of different things. There are, a lot, there are a number of different parameters in the PMNS matrix. They're accessed in rather different ways. Um, so we'll need, to, we, we'll need to look at some specifics. So I just tried to call out a couple here um, that have done these kinds of analyses and to, to show you what, uh, what they've done. So, so some of this you know, you've already seen. If you're paying sort of attention in the first couple of talks, you, 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 you probably noticed that there are some things here that, that definitely involve the hadronic system. For instance, I just pulled a, a couple of slides out of uh, Gabe Perdue's talk. Um, on Minerva, which is doing a, a CCQE uh, analysis in neutrinos and antineutrinos. And one of the things that he said is, we know that we're not going to be able to model very precisely the things that are going on right at the vertex of the event, so that they sort of, there's sort of a blinding in that region. There's sort of a vertex region where you know, you're, 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 you're not looking for, uh, for, for clusters and for uh, specific uh, kinds of uh, particles. But you know, that region involves a certain energy threshold. and so. Um, whether you're talking about the neutrinos or the antineutrinos, that introduces, even when you're trying to be blind to the hadronic system, that certainly introduces some uh, energy dependent uh, sort of thresholds for different kinds of particles. Of course, those are the things that are studied when one looks at systematic errors, but you can't sort of get around that fact. Um, and then, you know, in the talk, he was focusing on some of the things that are happening in that vertex energy region. Um, related to the discrepancies between the data here in black and the, the, the Monte Carlo, uh, which doesn't have things like uh, you know, two particle, two hole excitations in it, and trying to draw some inferences about the observations in the data, which require you know, a, a modeling of the, th that rather messy part of the event and the physics that's going on there and the associated error band with it. So one could also think about things that one would want to do in Minerva, where again, one has a lot of data that necessitates the use of the hadronic system. So in Minerva, in Gabe's talk, you heard about the muons being measured by going into to Minos, but that's a rather forward region of the Minerva detector. You could imagine uh, events where you have what looks like a very clean event, a well-identified proton, not a lot happening at the vertex, and the muon that goes out of your detector but doesn't go into Minos. So you'd like to be able to do an analysis with that event, but your only hope, because you know the muon direction, but you don't know its energy, your only hope of trying to reconstruct anything about the event in terms of the energy in Q squared, requires using some of that information from the hadronic system, from the proton part of the event. Okay. So, um, so that, that's the kind of stuff that you've already heard about a little bit uh, at this workshop. Um, so let me take now a couple of examples of some oscillation physics. So again, these are you know, a, a set of slides that are re really meant for the theorists. So for the experimentalists here, you know, if you want to nap for 20 minutes, and we can, we'll wake you up when we get to the end of this, that's totally, uh, that's totally fine. Um, so I tried to make it you know, as, as sort of straightforward as is possible without losing you know, the essential uh, features of this. So uh, in the MINOS experiment, it's a, it's a muon neutrino disappearance measurement. So we're creating a, a, a muon beam, uh, a beam of muon neutrinos, excuse me, at Fermilab, a near detector and a far detector. Uh, the detector is uh, alternating planes of steel and scintillator, and the steel plates are about one inch thick. OK, so you know, it's, our, it's our canonical near-far comparison. We collected a lot of data in both the detectors. We make a measurement of the beam and the cross sections. 
at the near detector, and we extrapolate that to the far detector. Okay, so uh, the key challenge is exactly what Ulrich was describing when in the context of the mini boon, the two particle, two hole stuff is you know, you don't measure neutrino energy directly. You measure a bunch of ADC counts or whatever you want to call it, some raw information from your detector, and you need to turn that into a neutrino energy. Okay, so here, you know, here are some typical, uh, these are DIS events uh, in the MINOS detector. And as you can see, the hadronic shower is, you know, it's just a bunch of, a bunch of hits, a certain amount of pulse height, a certain amount of energy um, at the vertex of this interaction. And you need to turn that information into a neutrino energy in order to do any kind of uh, fits to oscillations, because of course the os oscillation happens in, in uh, neutrino energy. Okay, so that requires a model that takes us from this kind of stuff that we see in the detector to the energy of the hadronic system, combining that with the, the measured energy of the muon uh, in MINOS as, as measured through, through the curvature, um, and uh, adding that together to get the neutrino energy. Okay, so and as, as Ulrich you know, pointed out in his talk, you need a model to do that. You need a matrix that takes you from your true energy to your measured energies, uh, your, your measured quantities in your detector, and that's what we use our Monte Carlos for. Okay, so the Monte Carlos uh, are the things that we use to do that task. Uh, they have models in them, and those models have some uncertainties. Okay, so, so as I said, you know, you, you, uh, in a nutshell, you have the measurement of the uh, muon neutrino charge current interactions in the near detector. Um, reconstructed uh, now in terms of neutrino energy, where you've used that, that essentially that matrix uh, that's embedded in your Monte Carlo that relates the, the visible uh, features of the, the data to the, to the true neutrino energy. You do the same sort of thing in the far detector. You extrapolate your, uh, your measurement here uh, in the near detector to the far detector, and there you have your, um, your nice data for an oscillation fit. And uh, as most of you, I'm sure, are aware, the the uncertainty, since, since the uh, neutrino energy in the oscillation equation is the thing that couples to delta m squared, delta m squared L over E, um, your ability to reconstruct that neutrino energy and your uncertainty on your reconstruction of that, which is ultimately tied to your uncertainty in your, in your models relating your detector, uh, you know, directly measured quantities back to this, uh, then become uncertainties on your oscillation parameters and delta m squared in particular. Okay, and delta m squared is you know, the most precise measurement that we have to date of delta m squared at the atmospheric uh, mass splitting. Okay. okay, so if we look at you know, how that would, uh, you know, how our modeling might uh, uh, affect a, a MINOS type measurement, if we look back at uh, the, one of the uh, more recent MINOS measurements of the uh, oscillations with the beam neutrinos, and we look at the systematic errors on the delta m squared uh, measurement, we see that the, you know, the largest contribution in terms of the systematic errors, well, the, the two largest come from uh, the, the energy measurements of the muon and the hadronic system. Um, and the largest contribution comes from the uncertainty in our, in our knowledge of the, uh, essentially the absolute energy scale of our, of our hadronic system. And that's coming from primary, two components. One is the uncertainty in our, the response of our detector to single particles, often related to, you know, to the, the data that was available in our test beam runs. But another component, and a, a somewhat larger component, related to our uncertainties in our modeling of the neutrino interactions and what are the, uh, what are the set of particles that are in an actual hadronic shower in these events. Okay, and so if we think about you know, how our uh, model aspects would, would, would turn into an uncertainty on the uh, on the uh, energy scale, you might think, well, it's a calorimeter. Does it really matter you know, what kind of energy you have in the hadronic system? It's there somewhere. You must be you know, capturing it somehow. Um, but you know, if you think about the way the detector works, you realize that isn't the case. The, the steel plates are one inch thick. So if you have higher energy particles and that energy gets degraded to, to low energy protons, that is, by low energy, I mean below 150 MeV, let's say, th say through pion absorption, those pions that would have been visible if they made it out are no longer visible, right? The protons get sucked right up in the steel. The neutrons you might never, uh, you might never even see. Um, you're, you're unlikely to capture a lot of the energy that goes into the kinetic energy of neutrons. Um, and also, if you just look at you know, uh, you know, pions in your detector, a charged pion uh, you know, of 1 GeV, let's say, produces about, uh, well, uh, a pi zero produces about 30% more you know, light uh, in the MINOS uh, scintillator than uh, a comparably uh, a, a charged pion with comparable uh, kinetic energy. So you have, um, 
a, uh, a difference in your visible energy based on the, again, this, this E to H ratio. Okay? So if there are things in your hydronic shower simulation that give you more or less pi zeros in terms of the total energy uh, distribution, if there are things that take higher, higher energy particles and turn them into lower energy uh, nucleons, that's going to affect the amount of energy that's going to be visible in your detector. So all of those kinds of things are the, the pieces that we need to evaluate the uh, uh, uncertainty associated with our, our models. Um, in order to evaluate the effect that it has on that oscillation measurement. Okay. And again, all of the things that we care about here are rather specific to the MINOS detector and to its, to its you know, uh, thresholds. Okay, so I'll take, I'll take another example. And this one's a little, a little, bit, more, a little bit more tricky. Um, and the issues that are faced here are similar to the issues that would be faced by, by, by NOVA and TDK that are also doing electron appearance um, in sort of Fuji EV. So, uh, if you look at what the data looks like in the, in the MINOS near detector, uh, from muon neutrino charge currents, well, we saw some examples of that, you know, a nice track and you know, a bunch of uh, hits here at the vertex for your hydronic shower, uh, your neutral current interaction, you know, a, a, a fair number of, uh, you know, in this case, probably three or four particles coming out with some spread, different kinds of particles, um, and a new E charge current where the majority of the energy uh, in this case, at least, is dumped into a single electromagnetic shower. They have different, obviously, topologies in your detector. And for any kind of a electron appearance analysis, or, or moreover, for any analysis, you'd like to be able to, to separate at least this category from that category. Um, so if we wanted to you know, do an analysis that's going to look for the appearance of new ECC in our far detector um, in a near-far comparison, well, we would you know, try to play the same kind of th game. We would want to measure the rate of that in our near detector to tell us how much of that to expect before oscillations, extrapolate that to our far detector, and see if we have an excess. So when we actually look at um, what we would expect in an experiment like MINOS, which admittedly is a, re a quite coarse detector for this kind of measurement, the backgrounds are going to come in three types. One is that there are electrons in the beam even before, electron neutrinos in the beam even before oscillations. We call that the intrinsic electron neutrino content of the beam. Um, we're going to have neutral current events that are dominated by electromagnetic activity. Um, MINOS doesn't have the angular resolution to tell that there is missing uh, transverse uh, energy um, in, at, in, in these interactions. So if there are a lot of pi zeros in your uh, neutral current, uh, shower, it, it could very well look like, like this guy over here. Um, and similarly, you know, the, the Y distribution is completely flat. So you know, there are you know, a factor of a few more CC events than NC events. If you have a very low energy muon in the event, it wouldn't be identified as a, as a track. That, uh, the hydron that, that CC event, that true nu muon neutrino CC event, could look like a new ECC event, okay? because the, the hydronic shower there um, basically, you know, would is it's for all intents and purposes a neutral current event, and it could could fall for the same reason. Okay, so uh, again, you know, you 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 build your two detectors, you run your simulations, you compare your uh, data distributions in your near detector to your Monte Carlo, and you see how you're doing. Uh, you would in a detector like Minos, you would combine a, a lot of different uh, observables into a single uh, discriminant that that you would use to characterize how electromagnetic the shower is, or how, electro, sorry, how electromagnetic, uh, sorry, how electron-like the, ov the overall event is. Okay? So this is a, a discriminating variable that we would use to select our new ECC candidates. Um, and so if you just sort of run the, the, the Monte Carlo, uh, in this case it's, uh, it was Nugen, the predecessor uh, of Genie, if you just sort of run it right out of the box and you were to compare your, your data to your Monte Carlo, and we could look at a lot of different kinds of distribution. So this is the comparison between them in terms of, a, a, again, a discriminating variable where things that are electromagnetic are supposed to be close to one, things that are less electron-like are supposed to be close to zero. You know, in, in, whether you're talking about normalization or shape, there are pretty substantial discrepancies at the order of tens of percent. Um, or if you looked at you know, a cut that you would want to make over here, so you're selecting just the events that look the most electron-like, and then you took those events and looked at their energy, uh, similarly, there are, there are rather sizable discrepancies, again, at the order of tens of percent if we're just comparing our out-of-the-box Monte Carlo to our data. Okay? And this doesn't surprise us, and this is why we build these near detectors, is that the, the, you know, this part of the event is just is, is rather hard to, uh, to simulate. Um, 
And to, uh, just in case I, I fall into this, in, in these kinds of plots, if you see something labeled CC, what that means is muon neutrino charge current events that are a background to electron neutrino charge current uh, appearance. Okay. All right, so let's just do that exact same game. Um, we, you know, we have a near-far comparison, so we think, OK, we're, we're good, right? So we, 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 we collect our data. Uh, we form our uh, electron-like discriminant. And we compare our data in our Monte Carlo here in the near detector. And then we, um, we you know, pick our events that are the most electron-like, which would mean placing a cut over here at sort of 0.7 or 0.8. If we look at what we would expect in our far detector, um, our background events, this red, uh, this isn't really working for me here. Go with this one. So the, the background events, this red histogram here, are basically you know what we've measured in the near detector, um, and the signal, you know, true Nui CC uh, appearance uh, would fall over on the right hand side of this uh, this kind of uh, distribution. Okay, so to pick out electron like events and to just do you know a, a count. You know, we would put a cut up here at you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. That keeps a good fraction of our signal um, and gets rid of most of our background. So we can do our appearance um, analysis. Okay, But the question it, the, then becomes, um, if I just try to do that in the most naive way, if I you know, uh, you know, put a cut up here and I say, OK, I have so many events here in the near detector, I want to extrapolate that to, to the far detector to predict my background in the far detector, we see pretty quickly that we're going to have a problem. Um, because this background up here, let's just f even completely forget about the intrinsic electron neutrinos in the beam for the moment. Let's just talk about those other two contributions to the background, the neutral current and the charge current uh, contributions to this. Uh, in this analysis, they, they come at about a 2 to 1 ratio. Basically, for every two neutral current background events, you have one muon neutrino charge current event. Okay, So if we think of. Uh, you know, this, this, that, that's, that comes from the Monte Carlo. So if we think of taking this measurement and trying to extrapolate that to the far detector, well, our neutral current events, they're not oscillating. So our neutral current events would sort of extrapolate directly. But when we talk about our muon neutrino charge current events, well, most of our muon neutrino charge current events are oscillating away by the time they get to the far detector. Okay, so let's say in the near detector here I had uh, the you know, three units of background, and two were NC and one was CC, in my extrapolation to the far detector, I would have the two units of neutral current you know, and appropriately scaled for the, the distance, uh, two units of NC background and a half a unit of CC background. So I'd have two and a half units of background. But if I'm uncertain in my hadronization modeling at the level of tens of percent, that total three event, or that total three units of background in the near detector could have really been you know, 2.4 units of neutral current and 0.6 units of charge current, which are going to extrapolate as you know, 2.4 plus half of 0.6 is 2.7. So my uncertainty now in my background prediction at the far detector is on the level of 10%, a little bit less than 10%, even though I have a near detector. Okay? And it's just because uh, of the, uh, the, the different components that I have uh, in my near detector. And again, those uncertainties that we have in the, in the modeling of, the of those particular contributions to the background is large enough that that becomes a very important uh, systematic, even with relatively modest statistics, um, that you would have in an experiment like MINOS. Yep. Can I add to that? Yep. Nice example. The ability to find the analysis of the near detector works in this case because MINOS and this also will be true for NOVA. You can simply have a functionally identical near detector. That's not the case. What's that? If What's the last if part? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so if, if we, uh, you know, we, we, as, as Jerry said the, the other day in response to a question from a theorist, there are a lot of things we don't tell you. Well, when we, when we talk about our experiments, we always talk about our near and far detectors as being identical. But if we put a near and detector, a near and far detector right in front of you, you'd say, wait a minute, that one's 10 times bigger than that one. You know, why, why, why were you telling me they're identical? They're, they're not identical at all. And a huge amount of intellectual investment goes into correcting for all the small differences that result from the different beams, the different geometries, the sizes of the detectors, their containment is different, their, the attenuation and the components of the detector would be different. Um, so, so you're right, in all of these kinds of experiments, that's 
usually one of the, the, if we went back, for instance, to the Minos analysis I showed you a minute ago, um, the third largest uncertainty here is what's called the relative normalization. And it's basically a measure of how well do we understand how the near detector performs relative to the, to the far detector. And that, that's for an experiment where they were designed to be pretty darn close in terms of their overall construction. Um, so the, the, the more different the detectors get, um, you know, the more, the more complicated that becomes as well. Yeah. 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 No, that's. And you know, let's not even talk about experiments that want to do far detectors without near detectors. Let's just, you know, <laughs> set that set that big concern aside just for the moment. Um, right. Okay. So that's that that that. So that's that's a fundamental uh, problem. And and having a near detector, even a completely identical near detector with a, compl a completely understood extrapolation from near to the far detector, even that doesn't get you out of the problem. Okay, so what Minos had to do was to, to, to use basically data-driven techniques to try to measure the composition of the near detector background um, in terms of its charge current and neutral current and electron neutrino charge current components. And the way that was done uh, was, uh, was a little bit tricky, but you could uh, think about the following kind of situation. If this is the, uh, the spectrum of um, charge current events in the, uh, in the Minos near detector uh, as a function of neutrino energy. And it has this sort of peak region where the horns are doing their focusing work. But in addition, you have this very large high energy tail, mainly from particles that go, th that go through the horns, high, high energy uh, pions that go through the horns without any, uh, without any deflection. Um, your, a lot of your uh, muon neutrino charge current background to that electron neutrino appearance since you're looking for electron uh, charge current events that are a few GeV, you have uh, energy cut down there. So uh, for these events to be background, they have to sort of come from this peak region. Whereas your neutral current backgrounds, uh, since you, know, you lose a lot of the, uh, the, the, the outgoing neutrino carries away a lot of the energy, your neutral current backgrounds to that you know, few GeV electron neutrino appearance mainly come up from, from, these, come from these higher energies up here. Okay, so what Minos can do is to actually just sort of kind of go in there and just flip the switch and turn the magnetic horns off and stop the focusing of the pions that are coming off the target. And suddenly your beam spectrum goes from this, you know, this nice thing that we're all used to seeing to this red thing down here, which is basically just you know, what you get when the particles uh, come straight off the target without any focusing whatsoever. Okay. So um, it, since, since this uh, part of the beam is essentially gone, and that's where most of your muon neutrino charge current uh, background events were coming from. You could use the, the data that you take in this uh, beam running uh, configuration to get a sort of an independent handle on the neutral current contribution to the uh, electron nu neutrino um, backgrounds. So there's a, you know, a, a somewhat more sophisticated uh, uh, treatment of this where you have uh, you know, uh, data that was taken in different beam configurations. The background then is written as a linear combination of the, uh, what you would expect to find in those different uh, beam configurations. And then you, you take your data and you invert some matrices to, to make a measurements of those, uh, of those background contributions. Um, and then you, you, you use that to then do your extrapolation to the far detector. So that, that's a little bit sort of technical in the details, but I think you can understand the gist uh, of, the, uh, of the analysis. Um, and the important sort of moral of the story was that because of the uncertainties in the hadronization modeling, even an identical near detector was not enough. They had to use data-driven techniques to make measurements uh, that could then be the basis of the extrapolation. And you know, in, in practical terms, it meant collecting a, a bunch of data that was not useful at all for oscillations, but it was only, it was only needed to do these kinds of, of data-based uh, corrections um, and things like that. So, as Sam said, as your near and far detectors get, get more dissimilar, or if you want to think about doing these kinds of measurements without a near detector altogether, um, your needs to really understand uh, you know, the, this part of the events can become quite important. So you, yeah. do you have an example of, I mean, you could argue that you have a better near detector. How could you go wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, uh, you, is there an example where you, that never worked? Right. I mean, you should be, you should be a better near detector, right? If you can, it helps you with extrapolation. 
Um, well, I, I think I, I'd say yes and no. I mean, I, I think that um, I, I think the, the basis of the extrapolation really does need to be. I mean, I think the approach is really sort of similar to what 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 TDK uh, has done. In, in an ideal world, you would have an identical that was functionally at, that was functionally identical to your fire detector. Okay, that, that's where you're measure, measuring most directly the convolution of everything. But to do this kind of decomposition, you would love to have a more capable detector that could you know, essentially help you with that decomposition, you know, that was able to measure uh, you know, the events at a higher level detail so that you, know, you could directly relate that to, to, the, to the measurement that you had in your functionally identical near detector. So you know, to me, yes, if you have an uh, you know, identical and then a more capable detector, that's sort of the perfect situation. Um, if you had to make me choose between a more capable one and an identical one, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure which one I would pick. Again, I'd have to know really about the specifics and what other tools like this might be available to you to, to do, to do data-driven kinds of corrections. It's hard to generalize on this, but I don't really yeah. think like a perfect detector with identical to the far detector and infinite statistics is going to get you out of trouble. No. <laughs> no. What, what you were always measuring is a convolution. Yeah. So, but I, I think you know the, uh, the, you know the, the conversation again. I, I always get nervous when we talk about these kinds of, about oscillation experiments and absolutes because again it really does depend as, as as we were hearing on the details of the measurement. I mean if this this is an example where a near detector alone, even a completely identical near detector, wasn't going to solve it for you, but you could imagine. Uh, you know, if those rates had been very different, if the background was all neutral current, for instance, then, then we would have been fine, right? Then we wouldn't have had this, this, we might have other problems, but we wouldn't have had this particular problem. So it really does, you know, come down to looking at, at, at the specifics of what's being proposed and the energy ranges and their, the acceptances and misidentification all, and all the kinds of messy stuff that we have, we have to deal with, okay? Um, okay, so if we wanted to then, you know, start to talk about the physics of this, just to, put this in the back of your mind. Uh, if you look at the Monte Carlo for that particular analysis, what were the kinds of events that we worried about uh, or that were coming into that, um, uh, that, that background sample to the new E appearance? They were, you know, uh, you know, some didn't even have pi zeros coming out of the nucleus. It was some kind of charge exchange or you know, sort of a, a rather strange topology, but single pi zero and, and, and multiple pi zero events uh, sort of in equal numbers. And most of the events were, and I, Hate this label. Uh, this isn't really DIS uh, in uh, in the generator. It was basically everything that's inelastic but not resonant. Okay, so that's our usual DIS, and then a lot of other stuff besides. Okay, so I'll do another one very quickly, and this is this is I think the most extreme example of why we care. Okay, and this is um, uh, you know something that uh, you know we're 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 pushing hard right now on LB and E, and I wanted to uh, you know sort of you know, describe it in at least a little bit of detail. So um, in LB and E, it turns out that if you put the detector underground and it's big enough, you can do a lot of good physics with atmospheric neutrinos. Okay? Same kind of stuff that SuperK did, but now in a different kind of detector. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of rich phenomenology that plays out in atmospheric neutrinos where you're seeing the, the physics in not just L, but L and E. There are matter effects that come in. Um, and some people are really pushing atmospheric neutrinos as really right now because theta 1, 3 is large as really maybe our best way to get uh, uh, one, of, one of the really good ways to get a, uh, a measurement of the mass hierarchy. Um, and so in uh, you know, fast Monte Carlo studies that were done uh, for L, B, and E, it turns out that if you had this 35 kiloton detector underground and you looked at the sensitivity to resolving the mass hierarchy, um, coming from the beam and then coming from atmospheric neutrinos, uh, the beam sensitivity has a, uh, a quite large dependence on the true value of delta CP, while atmospheric neutrinos are basically insensitive to that, that parameter. So it turns out 
that for values of delta Cp that are difficult for the beam, atmospheric neutrinos actually have comparable sensitivity to the mass hierarchy to the beam neutrinos for, for L, B, and E. Okay? Um, and in addition, you could do you know, all of the kinds of things that, that Super K has done in the past. And you, this is a reconstructed L over E, again, with some set of assumptions about um, efficiencies and smearing uh, of, the, uh, of the events in the LB and E detector. But you could see you know, gorgeous uh, types of uh, uh, features in the, this is you know, the ratio, this is the L over E distribution for your new mu charge current events as a ratio to no oscillation. So you, you've probably seen a, a plot like this. Uh, from super K before, where you've made some energy and direction cuts to pick events where a priori you think you have a better handle on what the true L over E uh, is. Okay. So uh, it could be a gorgeous device. And people have talked about using liquid argon detectors for atmospheric neutrinos for exactly these reasons for, uh, for decades. But if you start to think about why, why, atmos why, why, LB why a liquid argon detector does such a good job, and in particular, one of the things that, that we realized in doing some of these kinds of sensitivity studies in LB&E is that this relatively small LB&E detector for atmospheric neutrinos for this measurement does as well as hyper -K, okay, which is obviously a much, a much larger detector. And if we look at why that is, um, the reason is, is that uh, the mass hierarchy in atmospheric neutrinos appears as a, as a matter uh, enhanced resonance at a, in a certain region of energy and zenith angle space. So if I look you know, sort of down there with my atmospheric neutrinos, and I just look at events that are sort of 2 to 10 GeV, I expect a quite different uh, rate of nu mu to nu e transitions for uh, neutrinos if the hierarchy is normal, and for antineutrinos if the hierarchy is inverted. Okay? So because those come in with different cross sections, even if you don't have a magnetized detector that could tag yeah, the uh, neutrino versus antineutrino, uh, you do uh, a really good job, provided that you're able to look right in that, in that sweet spot for uh, the, the, the matter resonance. If you have very good energy resolution and you have very good directional resolution. So this is you know, the enhancement in the zenith angle and in energy. The potassium is kind of a smaller k three. Is that same square k three point zero two four? Uh, no, I don't think that's small. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's I don't yeah. So I think that's a reasonable number for for theta one three. Um, but this enhancement is completely driven by theta one three. So if theta one three was zero, it would, that wouldn't be there at all. Okay. But the key thing is that um, in liquid argon, we're claiming that you have a much better handle than you would in a water Trinkov det detector on, on the neutrino direction. And that turns out to be the limiting experimental factor in terms of how well you could resolve the mass hierarchy with atmospheric neutrinos. And of course, when you realize we're telling you we know where the neutrino came from, what we're really telling you is we're able to take all those hadrons that are in these 2 to 10 GeV sh of, uh, showers and figure out a formal momentum associated with it. Okay? And that, is not so easy. And let me, just to convince you, let me uh, show you a couple pictures of some uh, not typical, but challenging uh, events in a liquid argon, simulated events in a liquid argon detector. Also keep in mind for atmospheric neutrinos, you don't know the direction of the neutrino. You don't know the energy. You don't know the direction. You don't know the flavor. Okay? So you got a lot to do, but you have a very good detector. Okay? So here are a couple of events I just picked out of our simulation. So, you, so okay, if you had to guess, you know, neutral current, new ECC or new mu CC, what do you think? I mean, we have to you know, do some serious work to look at all these tracks, to look at how they're ionizing, to look at what happens at the end. Are there rescatters? Are there, are there uh, you know, various kinds of things? Um, so I'm not going to tell you the answer other than to tell you that it's hard. It's hard. If, if you've scanned a lot of these events, you realize even in a very, very capable device, you have a serious challenge ahead of you. Um, Sorry, say that again. Here, I didn't hear you. How confident are you in the statement that a 35 kiloton liquid argon detector performs as well as a water current or one megaton current off detector in atmospheric neutrinos? I mean, because the, 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 the hyper case study is based on a full Monte Carlo yep. simulation, which yep. is fully informed by all the uh, yep. experience, right? Yep. So it's a realistic, uh, completely realistic you know, for, for what can be achieved. Yeah. 
No, I, I hear you. So, I mean, I, I'm the Atmospheric Neutrino Working Group Convener on lb &E, so I, I have to give you, you know, you have to take that factor into consideration. So I, w I think the statement I made was not that it would be as good as, as Hyper-K, but comparable to, to Hyper-K, okay? So we don't know exactly how well we can do. I believe that the, the assumptions that are in the Fast Monte Carlo about the hadronic uh, directional resolution, they are based on, on previous studies from Icarus and other, and other uh, groups of, I think, 10 degrees, maybe 15 degrees. But that, that's really the linchpin. If that number turns out to be wrong, then the hierarchy gets a lot worse. I mean, nothing else really matters. The NCCC misidentification, it's really, it's, you, know, it, you don't really see it from these events, it's actually quite good. If we're off by that by a factor of a few, that probably isn't gonna hurt us so much, but it's really about um, how well you can reconstruct the hadronic part of the event. Okay, all right, so now let's, uh, let's start talking about some of the, uh, the models here. So that, that went a bit longer than I, and I'd hope, but I, I think that was uh, sort of important to set the stage here. So I wanted to, to emphasize something because I know we, this is a nuclear theory workshop and we talk a lot about generators and we, talk, we argue a lot about the nuclear physics that's in the generators. But to me, the free nucleon processes are extremely important largely because when we really dig down into our generators to see what's going on, um, we tend to blame everything on the nuclear physics when very often we have totally different inputs at the free nucleon level, okay? So, you know, like at the last new end, we, we, we produced plots that were meant to uh, simulate the kinds of physics that uh, an experiment like NOVA would care about. So this was for two GeV events on carbon, neutral current events only. What was the fraction of the total hadronic energy that went into electromagnetic particles? And so we would debate, you know, things like the different coherent models and the different models for nuclear de-excitation and all this kind of stuff. There are pretty big differences here that are obvious, but if we go back to, you know, to previous nuance and we look at studies that people did, this was one from back in new in 04, but the one from new in 09, you know, even shows it more clearly. If we talk about differences in, you know, I think this is single pi plus cross sections, we look at what comes out of the generators and out of the theoretical models, there's, there's quite a large spread. That's after it comes out of the nucleus, but if you go back and you say, well, let me turn off FSI and see you know, where did things go wrong? You're just as bad where, at where you started. So I don't know why we spend so much time arguing about this when we have a lot to argue about over here, and actually we have a lot of data that could help us figure out, you know, who's got it right and who's got it wrong. So uh, before we blame it all on the nucleus, I think we need to, uh, you know, really make sure we have our, have our story straight. Okay, so um, we have to say, I have to say too that when we talk about hadronization, um, you know, there are a lot of different processes that are involved for our inelastic reactions and our sort of fundamental picture of what's going on changes dramatically as we go up in invariant mass. So if we're, we heard a lot about the delta, we talked a lot about the delta, and in the resonance region, um, in principle, you know, if you have the, the I guess, the made analyses, um, you can calculate all the hadronic distributions that you would care about uh, from, from your theoretical tools. Uh, very often in generators, we don't do that, but we uh, know that a certain resonance has been produced and we know what its branching ratios are, so we do the decay, you know, a, as a phase space decay in the hadronic system. Um, for a lot of the resonances, that's maybe okay. Um, but we know that when we talk about higher energy, the picture changes to the kind of things that we were hearing from, um, from Sergey about this morning, where you, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have uh, quark and tr current jets, you have, you know, partons that are being struck, you have things that are trying to form in the nucleus. Um, so the, the fundamental picture is, is completely different, and the things that you're interested in um, looking at uh, shift considerably. So just wanted to, to, to make that point. And then to, uh, to, to say that, um, uh, to just be clear on some terminology here, uh, so this is uh, the invariant mass distribution of inelastic events in the Numi low energy beam. Uh, to give you a sense of the region that we sort of care about here, um, and, you know, you can see the big, you know, peak down here at the delta, this very long tail that goes up to, to high invariant masses that we would definitely want to treat in this sort of partonic picture. But there's a huge amount of stuff, you know, that's down in here, that's in this transition region, that, uh, you know, this is just one generator's breakdown of it. We could certainly argue for a long time about how it's done, but uh, the non-resonant contribution at low invariant masses. So there are a lot of different pieces that come into the cross-section as we go up in invariant mass. And each of those pieces to the cross-section, at least in a generator, is usually connected to a particular picture or 
or model for hadronization. So resonances would get hadronized one way. Your you know, typical DIS events get hadronized another way with a different piece of code and a different sort of fundamental physical picture. Um, so we, um, we talked a lot about resonances earlier in the workshop. Um, and it, it really seems to me like this is one of the last meetings we're ever going to be hearing about the Ryan Seagal model because it's on its way out in almost all of our generators. Good riddance, we all sort of agree on that, but it's been around for a very, very, very long time. So I just wanted to pay you know, homage to it um, and to talk, mention maybe why we loved it so much as experimentalists. Um, you know, so we always you know, talk about the Ryan Seagal model, but we don't point out that it was based on this FKR model. And the F was Feynman. And that was cool. Like Feynman was cool. Like if it's got Feynman in it, it's got to be good. And then you go and you look at the paper, you read the abstract, you're like, this is awesome. This is exactly what I need. Current matrix elements from a relativistic quark model. That's the physical basis for the model. It says a relativistic equation to represent the symmetric quark model of hadrons with harmonic interaction is used to define and calculate matrix elements of vector and axial vector currents. We think that's it. That's, that's exactly what we need. We're done. But if we read a little bit further in the abstract, we might have known we were going to be in trouble. At the end of the abstract, it says, 75 matrix elements are calculated, of which more than three quarters agree with the experimental values within 40%. <laughs> right? So you, know, you don't even want to know about those other quarter of the matrix <laughs> elements. You know, so. Yeah, without being any better. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, but one of the things that I didn't, I didn't hear discussed um, when we talked about models to replace Ryan Segal uh, the other day, and I talked with Louise a little bit uh, at some of the coffee breaks, is that you know, Ryan Segal also predicts the spin density matrices for the pion, you know, let's say just the, the one pion uh, production uh, for the, uh, the, the angular distribution in the hadronic center of mass. Okay, so it's, there's you know, helicity there, uh, you know, the spin three halves system. So this, this data, which is from uh, the BEPS experiment, isn't really the best. There, there are other data sets that show it much more clearly, but you know, it is not at all an isotropic angular distribution. Um, and it seems like the ways in which we're going to replace Ryan Segal, at least in some of our generators, don't give us the information that the, the model has to calculate those kinds of distributions. So we need to find another way to put it in to the generators you know, if we think it's relevant at the energies that we're, that we're interested in. So, um, you know, so you know, Uruk, it's a question for you. I don't know how other generators treat it, if their construction of resonances you know, correctly calculates all the, all the uh, you know, angular distributions in the hadronic centers of mass. Or I think it's in the neurons, but not on the sophisticated It impacts, for example, a coherent pion structure. Mm -hmm. okay, you, so that's pretty good, actually. I mean, in lots of cases in nuclear physics where you could calculate the angular correlation, yeah. it basically just meant it depends more on angular momentum conservation yeah. than Yeah, okay. So the prescription paper, it goes Okay. Um, okay. Um, but the only resonance where you did that or needed to do that was for the delta. Right. Right, okay. Okay. Which or That's all you cared about. Okay. Ulrich, how does, how does Jibu? Do that if you produce a higher mass resonance. The resonances already pay off the cost of you. Okay. And that's in wonderful agreement with everything we know from photonuclear, pion production, and nuclear. Mass. Okay. So it sounds like we need to worry about it for the delta and not for anything else. Because the other higher mass resonances are isotropic. Uh, mm, okay. Why is that? There are no, there, there are other. Well, it's, it sounds like what you said is it, it, it was relevant for mini boon, but that's just the delta, right? Okay, okay, okay. So maybe we, we just need to worry about that piece of it. Okay. So all right. So now I wanted to 
kind of walk back in time with you a little bit to uh, give you a sense of s some of the data. And there's a lot of it that's available um, when people were looking at hadronization on uh, free nucleons. Okay, so they had hydrogen deuterium uh, runs in bubble chambers. They had some deuterium runs as well, which aren't exactly free nucleons, but are pretty close. Um, and you know, if you remember, uh, you know, the, the images from those kinds of events, you see a lot of stuff. I mean, you have very, very good resolution on the hadronic system. So the kind of things that they would do event by event would be uh, come up with some estimate of the total event energy um, and reconstruct certain kinematic quantities. But uh, it was a lot easier to see charged particles than neutral particles. So they would do things like just count up the number of charged particles, uh, would do counting of, of neutral particles. They calculate you know, average charged particles at a particular invariant mass, calculate how the multiplicity distribution, what's the distribution of charged particle multiplicities at a particular invariant mass. So those are really just about particle counting of different kinds at a, at a usually at a fixed invariant mass. There's very little dependence in Q squared on those, uh, on, 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 on those quantities. Um, and then to get to that picture of, you know, is this a a current quark jet kind of model, or is it something more isotropic, as we were hearing, uh, is what is going on in the, in the, in the higher resonances, um, you'd want to look at the quantities in the hadronic center of mass. In okay? that quark picture, you'd expect things to be going forwards and backwards um, in, different, uh, in different amounts relative to the momentum transfer. Um, so they would look at everything in the, in the forward and backward hemispheres. They would look at the fragmentation functions, which is the fraction of the uh, total energy transfer that a particular particle has, uh, look at distributions of that, and then look at Feynman X distributions where this is the, the momentum of the part particle along the direction of the momentum transfer uh, compared to the maximum that's allowable kinematically. So this is essentially telling you if this is positive, this is a particle that's going in the current direction. If it's negative, it was going backwards relative to the current. So in this picture of a single nucleon uh, in the center of mass, a nucleon coming in, the W coming in, you know, you hit one of the quarks, that, that's sort of your current jet, and the, the two di quarks, quarks are traveling in the, in the negative xf direction. So this uh, is the right reference frame to be exploring those kinds of dynamics, looking at distributions of the Feynman x and also the transverse momentum relative to the, uh, to the, to the current direction. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of papers, again, on free nucleons for all these kinds of quantities. So you know, just some uh, you know, typical kinds of measurements. Uh, Feynman X, again, uh, forward hemisphere, backward hemisphere, with cuts on, uh, sorry, this is sorry, uh, the average PT as a function of Feynman X in different slices of invariant mass, um, looking at the average PT in different slices of invariant mass, forward and backward hemispheres. Um, so really trying to uh, understand the, the nature of hadronization, and in particular, trying to find you know, evidence for this partonic picture was a focus of a lot of these papers from the 70s and the 80s. So things like fragmentation functions. Um, and again, there's a lot of data, neutrino data, fairly precise on free targets that one can use for um, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of comparisons to, to generators. OK, so let me tell you very briefly about um, the model that's in Gini. There are a lot of common ingredients with this model and the others that are in generators. Uh, and I'll try to uh, emphasize a few of those as, as we go here. Um, and if we wanted to talk more about the details, uh, we could do that uh, later on. Um, but when I talk about a hadronization model, I'm basically talking about a piece of code that has the job of uh, taking a four momentum transfer to uh, the nuclear system, or in this case, the nucleon system. Uh, particular uh, boson and target, proton or neutron, and turning that into a set of four vectors for different kinds of particles. So um, it does it in sort of two steps, at least in uh, Gini. The first part is you decide what particles you're going to create, and then you distribute the momentum and, and energy that's available to those particles in the hadronic center of mass. Um, so this is sort of a Gini focused set of slides here, uh, the next set of slides. Um, and I wanted to uh, admit to something, a couple days ago I was complaining to some of my experimental colleagues about this whole uh, argument about what spectral functions mean. I said, it's really frustrating when I hear the same term and it means something different. I get so confused. Um, and then I realized experimentalists are almost as bad at it uh, in some ways. And Ulrich earlier this summer had, had told me that he'd heard about Genie in the news. So I had to go look into that. And this was what he was referring to. Um, 
The headline was Codename Genie, NSA to control 85,000 implants in strategically chosen machines around the world by year's end. So just to be clear, that's, if you hear that genie, that's not us. <laughs> that's not us. That is a totally different genie. We have nothing to do with, nothing to do with that. We could really run some Monte Carlos on those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Well, you know, there's really no backdoor in the code. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So uh, one common ingredient in all these generators is that we're, uh, we're very, uh, when we're at very high invariant masses you know, in this well sort of established uh, uh, DIS region, we all use Pythia, um, which at the hadronization, for, at least for the hadronization, in some cases also for the generation of kinematics. So all of our um, codes make some kind of a transition. Uh, Neuro actually uses, uh, uses Pythia for the non-resident piece all the way from uh, inelastic threshold. But you know, we, we transition over some range of invariant masses, typically, um, into hadronization using the Loon model. And as a generator developer, I always take it a little bit personally uh, when people just run Genie as a black box. They don't care anything about the physics. But then I turn around and run Pythia just like a black box. So you know, we're, we're, we're all kind of guilty of that at some level. But um, you know, this is what generates the hadronic systems for a lot of the events, if you're, particularly if you're in a beam that has a, a large you know, high energy component. So one of the things that, um, so in this picture, you know, you have your, maybe in the lab frame, a proton, your W plus came in and hit the proton. So in the hadronic center of mass, that's, that W plus has turned that, one of the down quarks into an up quark. So the basics of the looned, uh, you know, string fragmentation are, there's a, you know, a color uh, flux tube that's being stretched apart as these two, two objects move away in the hadronic center of mass. And when there's enough energy in that, you can create a quark anti-quark pair. Um, that has with, where those quarks have some transverse momentum relative to this, uh, to this current direction here. So that process just then repeats itself until you don't have enough energy left to, to do this. And then it goes into another kind of fragmentation called cluster fragmentation to bundle up the remaining low energy into a set of, uh, into a set of hadrons at the end. So when you run JetSet, there are, you know, there are a few parameters that you can tweak that change aspects of the model that change the relative probability of getting an SS bar pair when they you know, pop out of the, uh, the vacuum here, or out of this flux tube, um, that change the transverse momentum that they can have relative to the current direction. There's some parameters related to that. And then there are a set of parameters uh, in, in Pythia related to how it handles this low energy uh, string breaking and the, and the cluster fragmentation that happens at the, uh, at the, en at the end of the, the hadronization process. So one of the, the, the things that I think the, the new row uh, was really the, the generator that I think most carefully looked at the effect of all these parameters on the, on the hadronization uh, observables and on the comparisons to that external data. Um, and various generators in order, particularly ones like, like nukes that were used um, for higher energy experiments, found that they had to tweak some of these parameters from their nominal values to get reasonable agreement with their data. So the, tr the trouble is always when you start to tweak around these Pythia parameters, yep. you may make some harm somewhere else, you know, in some other reaction. And uh, it's a tricky thing to do this thing by just looking, let's say, at neutrino data and fit the parameters to neutrino data and take the same Pythia out to proton data, let's say, or to ion reconstruction, whatever, and it won't work anymore. Okay. So Okay, well that's why we're Yeah, but that's that's why we're here. But the fragmentation itself and the physics process should be independent of the way how you bring the energy into the system. So there are certain things that should not be tuned to the neutrino reactions. I think that one would have to aim for a more general thing. Actually I think the, the most uh, most work was put into the tuning the, the point is mainly with that really a high energy event generator. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And uh, I think the farmers group spent a lot of work on that. I mean, there were many years of doctoral students who were trying to figure out optimal parameters right. for Hermes uh, hadronization experiments. And uh, that's probably the most uh, detailed stuff that exists so far. Right. Um, but I, and yeah, uh, yeah, I think. I don't know if I com complete. We'll come to some slides in a minute. I don't know if I completely agree that one would expect the hadronization process to be completely independent of probe. I think the first order you would expect that to be true, 
But I don't know that I would agree that to be true, agree that that should be true, too, true at the, what, 10 percent level, few percent level? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I could, I could, we could give physics reasons why we wouldn't expect them to be the same. So I, I also take your point that, I think the point's valid, that like when we've contacted the, you know, the pithy authors to ask for advice about you know, parameters or running it, they sort of say, well, you're, like, you're way low energy for us. You know, there aren't many people that care about you know, all this, you know, the kind of stuff that you, that you care about. So I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, personally, our, my, my job is to describe neutrino data, not Hermes data in, in this generator. So if that argument is true, you know, if that tr argument is true at the sub-percent level, then you're right. The Hermes data is much more accurate than the, than the data you're going to see from neutrinos. But I don't think it is. So. But John, if you go to real high energy beams, let's say you would need that same PPR for the secondary interactions, where the incoming particle is no longer a neutrino but a pion, let's say. You know, and then uh, you don't want to have for every step in your reaction, you don't want to have a new set of parameters. Well, okay. So let's let's go go on. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you run Pythia with its default, gener default settings, you will not describe neutrino data correctly. Okay, I mean, that, that's, that's an empirical fact that you're about, you're about to see. And, there's, and the, da the data that we're going to talk about, that you're going to see, is very precise data. And there, there's no, because of the way that the measurements were done, it's not like they have this flux uncertainty. I mean, these are normalized to the center mass counts, right? So, um, you know, we, we clearly have to, uh, you know, have to, have to do something. Um, so uh, one of the you know, typical kind of empirical results that was known was the fact that the average charged particle multiplicity at sort of high invariant masses goes roughly with the, uh, uh, with the log of the, of the, of the uh, invariant mass. So sorry, the piece that I'm describing now is how we, uh, in Gini, and there are similar techniques in other generators, generate the hadronic system for events that we've decided are too low in invariant mass for uh, Pythia to handle. Okay, so um, there's the particle content selection and then the particle four vector selection in the center of mass. So typically we take parameterizations of the uh, average charge particle multiplicities, which are very precisely measured, multiply that by 1.5, which is the approximate ratio of, of neutral, neutral pion to total charge pion production in these, uh, that was also measured in these experiments. Use a very nice uh, empirical relation called uh, KNO scaling, which is a statement that basically if you, if you plot the probability of measuring a particular charge particle multiplicity at a particular invariant mass, and you multiply that by the average charge particle multiplicity at that invariant mass, and you plot that against the multiplicity divided by the, uh, by the average, so you know, looking for a 20% excursion away from the mean, let's say, um, th those data for a whole bunch of different invariant mass ranges fall on a universal curve. Okay, so basically all we do is parameterize the shape of that curve, which is a, uh, well described by a Levy function. I don't know any theoretical arguments to explain the shape of that, that curve. There, there probably are some. Uh, but in any case, that, that functional form describes that empirical relationship quite well. And then we use that to select the uh, actual particle multiplicities on an event by event basis. Um, then it, it's uh, the baryon selection and the, uh, the charge pions are selected to balance the overall charge of the hadronic system to get it back to zero charge. And then however many hadrons you think you need uh, or, that, or that you need to produce an overall uh, event are selected just according to these probabilities. So if you need uh, six, you know, four more hadrons in your event, um, and you, you know it, it, its uh, charge is down to zero. You could you'd, you'd pick pi plus pi minus pairs with a 60% probability, pi zero pi zero pairs with a 30% probability. Very simple um, kind of approach. But then you could look at things like the average pi zero multiplicities as a function of that, uh, invariant mass. How does that little step come about in this pi zero? Uh, well, almost all the st in the Gini curves, almost all the steps that you see come come from the transition between this model and Pythia, which is running up at higher invariant masses. So it's a little bit washed out here because we're not looking at it in invariant mass, but it's a little bit more clear. And I think the new row work that I just alluded to briefly was the one that most carefully tried, I think because it doesn't have the same transition in this way, is, the, is, the, is free of these kinds of uh, discontinuities um, or, or, or you know, slope changes like that. Okay, so. Um, the other thing that is to, you know what set of particles you have and then you need to put them somewhere. 
um, in the hadronic center of mass. Again, in a resonance type model, you would just do a phase space decay of all those particles. In a, uh, a jet-like sort of picture, you would expect the baryon, which would be more likely to form out of the, the die quark in the system, to appear more likely in the backward uh, hemisphere. Um, and you would expect the overall pions to have a lot of longitudinal momentum, but very little transverse momentum. So we just parameterize a couple of features that are known from the data to try to mock up that a bit of that physics. This is an experimental measurement of the Feynman X distribution of uh, protons uh, from one of the BEPS bubble chambers, uh, you know, showing that they do uh, appear predominantly in the backward hemisphere. Um, empirical results about the PT distribution of the pions, and then essentially use those two uh, uh, fits as um, uh, PDFs in generating the, the particle content. So. Um, you could then do things like, uh, let me skip some of this at the bottom here, move a little bit faster. One could look at running uh, a, a generator over a broad energy range, plotting the, this is a plot of essentially the, the charged uh, particle probabilities at a particular invariant mass, the probability for uh, anti-neutrino, this is a hydrogen uh, run actually, of producing um, you know, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, uh, charged particles in the event. Okay, so all, at any particular invariant mass, all of these curves have to add up to one. Um, you can see a, a lot of these kinds of wiggles are, w again, where we're transitioning from this AGKY, this empirical model that's trying to do one thing to, to Pythia, which is trying to do something else. Um, that's where all that kind of weird stuff comes from. Um, and uh, again, this is data. The error bars aren't shown on this data, but they're relatively small, particularly at the very lowest invariant masses. So uh, this isn't uh, a lot of pretty data, but I wanted to come back to it maybe in just a minute to make some final, final points. I mean, you're, yep. you're doing the same thing about the fact that if, if the high masses are seeming very badly in this, the data. Uh, that's just pithy. That's that's pithy. Just pithy. So yep. If you, so if you try to tune the lower multiplicity, the higher multiplicity just fall apart. Is that kind of what's happening? Well, OK, so, uh, sorry. So, because, uh, I mean, I might infer that that's what you've gotten from working with these. Right? Uh, no. Um, so. So maybe, maybe I will mention a couple, of, a couple of things here. So at these high invariant masses, Pythia does everything. Okay, so that, that AGKY model I just described doesn't, doesn't do a, a thing. So the only way to fix agreement up here is to play with those Pythia parameters. Okay, we haven't done that. Oh, you are okay. Okay, we, have, we, we, we adopted a set of parameters that, that some other neutrino experiment had used that they said worked for them. It doesn't produce agreement with this data. Um, but I, maybe, I, I, maybe this would be, well, uh, maybe we'll come back to this if we have a little bit more time. Okay. Um, the, the approach that I described is rather similar, I think, at least in spirit, to what is in, uh, to what is in Newt, where there are simil similar kinds of parameterizations for the overall charge particle multiplicities, and uh, there try to treat explicitly the forward and backward hemisphere um, differences that are seen in the charge particle multiplicities. Um, but you know, it, it's easy to just digitize all that data. There's a ton of it out there. Um, run the simulation compared to the, the data from a lot of different experiments. Um, this is looking at ha you know, positive positively charged hadrons. So there'd be some protons here that tend to populate the backward hemisphere. Um, and as you can see, the model isn't perfect, um, you know, but you have at least data that you can compare to. One of the real challenges, though, when we look at the data that's out there is there really isn't a whole lot that gets down to the, really the invariant masses we care about, which is, you know, this, this is a rather rare set that goes all the way down to two, okay? So um, if you remember that plot I showed you earlier, um, we, you know, in, in principle, we care about data all the way down to the inelastic threshold because we're trying to build an overall hadronization model that works for resonances, non-resonant non background at low invariant mass, as well as for um, shallow inelastic and deep inelastic scattering, okay? So, I you know, wanted to show at least one slide from, from Neuro where, because it doesn't have a kind of a transition between two different approaches, doesn't have the same kinds of discontinuities uh, or, or these slope changes that uh, the, the Gini model um, has. Okay, so I uh, wanted to say a few things about a paper that just came out a couple weeks ago, actually, at the end of November um, by Kuzman and Naumov. Um, mean charged multiplicities and charged current neutrino scattering on hydrogen and deuterium. It's a, it's a lovely piece of work. 
um, in that it, 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 it combs over a huge set of data from a lot of different experiments. It does all the really hard sort of archaeology of figuring out what earlier publications are duplicated in later data sets, um, so what, what data was maybe retracted by experiments, um, and sort of sorting through and deciding which is the, really the right data to use in a global type fit, um, data without kinematic cuts, for instance. And a lot of you know, consistency checks you know, of the kind that we heard about a little bit earlier on the DIS measurements uh, to, you know, to do a global fit with a, with a, with a consistent data set. So they you know, suggest some fitting functions. They do a comparison to generators and to the, the, the pi p data that you were talking about, Ulrich, and they show that they're not actually identical um, the way you would expect. Um, and then they also show that there's a, a bit of a disagreement if you just look at you know, neutrino proton, uh, that neutrino proton in hydrogen and neutrino proton in deuterium are not exactly the same thing, and they can make some, can quantify that difference and make corrections on it later so that you can take that deuterium data and use it to, in some sense, get a free, nu a free neutron set of multiplicities. So, um, you know, for those of you that like this kind of stuff, I strongly recommend reading the paper, taking a look at it. It has, you know, a lot of this kind of stuff in it. You know, all the old data sets, very carefully combed through. <coughs> These kinds of fits. This is for uh, muon neutrino proton. Uh, goes to, uh, uh, well, uh, this is on uh, charge current on hydrogen and deuterium. And so they've identified the data sets that, that they, they use in the fit, ones that they don't because they have kinematic cuts primarily, but that are shown for, for a comparison, um, and have a fitting function that gives a very good chi-squared, um, and error, bar, error bands on their fit parameters, which are really, really small. Um, they do some, then some comparisons to the various uh, generators, Neuro, Genie, um, and Jibu are all sort of shown on a lot of their plots, and they compare to um, some of the kinds of things that uh, Uruk was talking about, that is, uh, you know, basically what you would get from pion uh, scattering at comparable invariant masses. And, you know, it's, it's similar but not identical, uh, I would say, to the, to the, to the neutrino data. Um, similar kinds of things uh, uh, for deuterium. And you can, you can see, you know, differences between the generators and these data um, you know, at the, at the tens of percent level, maybe, t you know, a little bit more than 10 percent level. Um, some of the generators, uh, like Neuro and Genie, have at least made some attempt to be tuned to this data. Jibu uh, has not. Um, so that explains, you know, some of the differences. Um, but they have a lot of uh, this kind of thing in it uh, for the uh, anti-neutrino proton um, as well. Again, fits with very, very small, um, very small error bands. So, um, you know, this is really maybe stuff just for the sort of aficionados here. But I, I did want to uh, show some of this data because I wanted to uh, come back to the, one of the questions that's come up a couple times at this workshop of consistency. We talk a lot about consistency and we've heard a lot about consistency and how important it is. And I don't disagree that I would like to be consistent in what I do. But we all know that in all of our generators, we don't use a consistent model from this threshold all the way up to here. I mean, none of us do, and none of us ever will, right? We use models for the delta down here, and we use part-time models up here. And we're all going to do that forever, OK? So for me, the issue is not, and for each of those different scattering pictures, we're going to have a different kind of hadronization model. We all just accept that. For me, the question is, you know, we're going to have to glue models together. I want to have good glue. I mean, I want to have data that is precise, that I can, you know, compare an overall you know, tuned, tuned model that I can tune my model to, that I can look at how the overall, you know, set of ingredients agree with what's known about that process. So for me, the consistency is not the thing that keeps me up at night. It's trying to really think about, you know, what is the right kind of data so that when all these ingredients go together, we have our parameters, we have our models, and we have to see how well it does. Ultimately, this is the kind of stuff I care about. And it's not, you know, real sexy physics. It's, you know, charge particle multiplicities versus invariant mass. But it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that really, um, in my mind at least, is the thing that holds the generators together and makes them useful. OK. So I didn't really leave enough time for this subject, which is a pity. But we, we heard a fair amount about it in some of the previous talks. And it's an extremely rich uh, topic that I'm not an expert at, but other, other people here in the room are. Um, but I sort of intentionally he emphasized it a little bit because, again, we have so many differences just at the free nucleon level that I think as a community we need to really uh, sort of address those first. But 
when we talk about hadronization in nuclei, there's a lot of physics going on there. We heard about it uh, in both the last couple days, and um, Sergey gave a very nice description of the fundamental uh, issues related to the, the, the formation times, the coherence lengths, uh, all of that kind of uh, thing, and the effect that it would have on the formation of hadrons and their propagation uh, through the nucleus. Um, what is done in many generators is often a single quantity uh, or a very simple parameterization of all of that rather uh, separate, in some cases, complicated physics. Um, and there's a very nice paper by, uh, by Jan and his team uh, from last year that really breaks down the treatment of these, this kind of effect for a lot of different generators and then for a lot of different processes and shows that there's quite a variety of treatments um, when we look at what uh, is in the generators. Um, and I'll say uh, something about what Jibu does in a moment, because Jibu, uh, I think, has the most sophisticated treatment of these kinds of effects and has been tuned to a lot of data that the other generators have not. Um, but they have a somewhat, uh, somewhat similar, at least in spirit, approach to the highest energy events, the DIS events, but very, very different uh, treatments for the nucleons uh, produced in quasi-elastic and resonant um, events. So. Uh, again, the kind of thing where there is a very large body of data, a lot of data that was taken um, in, in many experiments, in particular at Jefferson Lab, trying to uh, explore the phenomenon of color transparency, looking at uh, uh, essentially quasi-elastic type kinematics, looking at the, how often that, that struck proton sort of a, is emerging roughly in the direction that you would expect it to, um, calculating that as ratios to, uh, to, you know, to, to a model or to, to deuterium in some cases. And, uh, looking, you know, for uh, ultimately a rise in these uh, in these curves as as uh, color transparency kicks in. Uh, some of the data that we saw earlier uh, on hadron attenuation in uh, in nuclei again double ratios that make it sort of easier to um, to measure and to and to calculate. Um, and these are ratios that can be binned in any way you like in kinematics. Um, it's been studied extensively in in all those variables and a variety of uh, labs. So um, just to uh, briefly describe how these effects are treated in some of the generators, and for those that use, use internuclear cascades, it's often a simple matter of um, if a particle is created and it has to you know, fight its way out of the nucleus, you give it uh, a free step. It can travel a certain distance before you actually start propagating it through the cascade. Um, that distance it has a zero interaction probability, and how long is that distance, or how long is that, that time for that to happen? Um, there's a uh, new row uses uh, an argument. Um, I think this comes from, if I'm remembering, uh, DPM Jet has a similar, Fluka. from Fluca, yeah, has a similar uh, uh, a treatment of uh, the, the process of, of, uh, of coherence lengths as the, the, the main idea for the quasi elastic. Uh, interactions uh, employs a similar um, treatment for the uh, for the delta, whereas in other generators the delta is just a delta and it propagates as a delta. Um, in Gini, it, it, the delta decays basically right where it's produced, uh, and, and the pions uh, travel out with their full interaction probability from that point. Um, and for the for the DIS events, uh, or really the non-resonant inelastic events, um, in most generators the first uh, push to put this kind of uh, physics in came from, again, although it was well known in electron scattering and charged lepton scattering, uh, from the results of the, the SCAT um, experiment, which gave at a, one of the first nuances a very, very simple parameterization of the kind of uh, co you know, free step that you need to put in an, into an internuclear cascade to get uh, good agreement with their data. Um, more sophisticated and theoretically motivated um, forms for that, uh, for that same physics. Uh, are in um, DPM jet cascade codes, and this is also um, incorporated into some generators. Um, and what we tried to do in Gini was to uh, recast this equation in this somewhat more complicated form, but in doing that, we sort of neglected to notice that there was a, a mass term um, in there. So if you compare the formation zone for pions as a function of pion momentum for the different generators, uh, they all look fairly similar. Genie and Newt are both trying to do this, this thing. Uh, they, they look exactly the same for pions, but um, for nucleons, uh, Newt and Genie are, 
are, are quite different, and it's because uh, in Genie the mass, uh, the mass isn't quite handled correctly. So um, that's the, the simplest way to incorporate that in an internuclear cascade, uh, based somewhat on data at least. Um, but Jibu, um, as we heard, Jibu is nature. Jibu has been used to study this kind of physics, and in some cases, the physics that's in Jibu has been developed um, as the physics has been explored. Um, so this is uh, uh, Ulrich and collaborators have a series of very nice papers describing the, the Jibu treatment of this and the data uh, associated with it. Um, and at my understanding of it is that uh, it, it uses the production and formation times as determined by Pythia as part of its string fragmentation process. And linearly, uh, possibly linearly and possibly starting from a pedestal, which would be the, the, uh, uh, the CT, uh, the color transparency uh, cross-section, uh, scales it up to the full hadronic cross-section over that, over that length. And I'm not, not sure I completely described that correctly, but uh, when you do that, this is the agreement that you get um, between Jibu and some of that uh, hadron transparency data I mentioned earlier. Um, and there are lots and lots of uh, plots of, of the hadron transparency data in a lot of different kinematic variables and uh, uh, you know, quite good agreement with, uh, with the Jibu uh, uh, predictions uh, in, all of those, in all of those cases. So, um, so obviously, you know, this is another area where the generators are quite far apart in their initial ingredients. Um, a lot of data and uh, some generators have done more than others um, to uh, compare to it. Okay. So in conclusion, um, simulating hadronic interactions, or, sorry, the hadronic part of the interactions is important. Um, in my opinion, one of our main activities for the short term for our community is to, is to step away from the nucleus just a little bit to, to really look at the free nucleon hadronization. Uh, the data that's there is quite precise. Um, in some of the main variables that we care about. Um, and some of the limitations that are present, that is things like uh, trying to look at variables in the hadronic center of mass, but at low invariant masses, which is challenging in a bubble chamber experiment, um, could perhaps be addressed at least somewhat by uh, analyses in cl with class data. Um, and the hadronization of nuclei is obviously uh, far more complicated. The physics is quite, uh, you know, quite rich and, and extremely interesting. But uh, there is uh, clearly a lot of data that uh, has been used, uh, at least in the case of GBU, that could also be extended to uh, comparisons with other generators. So thank you. Thank you very much for reading a wonderful summary. Yep, yep, yep. So, uh, so you're right. Th there, there are a fair number of studies like that. Um, the challenge with MINOS is that the detector is so very coarse that you know you really don't learn a lot. But um, all of the variables that are like one of the uh, the uh, electron-like discriminants I talked about has 11 input, you know, nodes into the neural network, and so um, you know people have looked at you know how they all compare to the model. The uh, the gist of it is that the model, I think, at these, these energies, you would do better with a model that was more phase space-like than the model we have right now. Okay. So um, whether that's the free nucleon part of the model or it's, it's um, you know, related to the, to the nuclear uh, the physics, the showers are, uh, are you know, are that, that if you could change that part of the model, that would, that would be, be the thing that would, would improve things the most. Um, some of the... The kinds of things, of course, in MINOS that we did was uh, as much as possible to incorporate the uncertainties on the model aspects into reweighting tools, so you could you know study these kinds of things directly. Um, the other thing that was uh, seemed a little bit uh, overdone, perhaps, was this. Um, it turns out that the the, the at these low invariant masses, there aren't a lot of particles in the event, and the the selection of the baryon has a real big impact on how the shower looks. So if you're 
forcing that baryon to be two backwards, you know, if, the, the, if you only have one or two pions and they have to go in the current direction, when they get boosted back to the lab frame, they have all the energy. So when we played around with this parameterization or, or made that softer, if you just did a, if you just ran jet set and looked at what that distribution looks like over different ranges of invariant mass, it never looks like that. It, it, it is shifted towards the backward hemisphere as you go up to higher invariant masses, but at, at these sort of relatively low invariant masses, it's much more peaked in the middle. So, so yeah, so we did a lot of that kind of played a lot of those kinds of games in, in Minos, but Minos had other ways to get around the problem without having to actually go back in and, and improve the hadronization model you know, that was there. But from those studies, we did get at least some broad insights about what parts of the model are, are, are need more work. But, but a lot of those kinds of things that I was telling you about are relatively indirectly explored at Minos. But if we go back and look at those bubble chamber data, yeah, I mean, everything I just told you about what Minos data seems to tell us, that bubble chamber data tells us too. You know? So I think if we'd done a more careful job at really tuning as much as we could to that data, we would have done better for Minos, which sort of seems obvious in retrospect. But. Towards the end of your talk, you explained these various descriptions about formation Times are time scales that play a big role in these in high energy events, in particular in events that cover uh, invariant masses above uh, 2 GV or something like that, where individual neutral resonances disappear and uh, where one doesn't really know how they behave and so on. So, in that sense, uh, it, you were perfectly all right. As soon as you are in the future regime, this is a valid concept. Mm. But then still has to worry, sort of say, what happens during this formation time? How do the interactions evolve and so on? But I want to make one point quite clear. In the resonance region, formation times play no role whatsoever. All the timing information involved in the resonance region is given by the width of the resonance, and there is no room for a free parameter. <coughs> in particular, introducing then on top of that, I mean, a sort of assumption that during this formation time there is no interaction just contradicts everything we have for example from pion neutron delta dynamics in nuclei that would mean that in any optical model description of pion scattering of nuclei you would have to sort of turn off your absorptive part for a certain point after mm -hmm. the vertex and then turn it on only later and so on. there's no indication whatsoever for that so delta for example decay exponentially according to their lifetime. And once they decay, the pion is there and the, the, the pions appear, so to say, also exponentially then, and they will interact from the first moment on. Mm -hmm. So somehow, if generators actually have the formation time, the resonance region will simply grow in at variance with everything we know about pion nuclear and delta dynamics. Can I comment on that? Because I think we've, we've had this discussion over a series of new ones now, so we might as well continue it. Here's the, here's the situation that we actually measure with the tevatron neurons. We have, we have 480 GPB neurons coming in to a series of nuclear targets from deuterium up to uh, up to T. What we saw is that for sure when we were in the so-called DIS region, W greater than two, Q squared greater than uh, probably four. We did see evidence for formation length by looking at the, the uh, X binding distribution of scattered pions. We then started to explore how low could we go and still see this evidence. Obviously, when we went down to the delta, we didn't see any evidence. We, you were right. But there is a, it's called a transition region between 1.7 and 2, where we still saw evidence of a uh, formation. So what this means is I think maybe the continuum that's underneath the resonances. We were seeing some kind of formation type effect. So I think we just have to be very careful about where we, where we what we call the region where we can use formation yeah. lengths yeah. and the resonance. But there is no question. I mean, this has been looked at for 30 years in pion physics is a whole textbook on this energy regime around by Ericsson and Weiser and so on. There is no room for any additional parameters. The relevant parameters are the decay width of the resonances. If you can't resolve the individual resonance anymore, which is roughly enough to be, you know, we can now debate whether 2 or 2.1 two something like that is the right number, then indeed these formation times come in. 
associated with that comes to meet this question of when do we, after the time, you know, what happens during that time period, is the cross-section zero or is it reduced to something of two power values, no? But uh, in the resonant region, there is three of the Well, yeah, so as you say, you say two yeah. or 2.1, I say, what if it's 1.8 uh, yeah, or but 2? Then, but then it would so take think, a very deep, it's it would take a very switch. Deep, it would take a very detailed analysis of the data within a resonant framework that probably nobody has done. But what I know is that this has been, at least for the last 20 years or something like that, this file has been with photon and use and so on. So that is the base pattern. So, so to be continued at 2 and 14. Well, yeah. Wouldn't it be a function of what the width of that resonance is? Yeah, sure. But the width gives the time. I mean, you don't need an additional parameter, so to say. No. I think all I'm saying is that it's not, I don't think it's a, a binary switch. I think it starts. So that is true. That's clearly true. It will start slowly, but I thought it would start at 1.7. That would contradict the cross of many things, at least the second resonance region, which is. Let's say 1.65 or so is still perfectly useful. Very yeah. good resonance. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really interesting because uh, you start from low energy and you say, oh, what's the formation? You don't even think about it. You have a very clear picture in terms of mesons and nucleons. You put them together and photons. You put them together and you get a really good description up to around 1.6 or so. And then it starts getting fuzzy because there's a lot of more complicated processes. You guys start from really high energy and start coming down, right. and uh, and then it starts getting fuzzy around uh, too. <laughs> so uh, it's this region here where <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, really nasty. Fuzzy. Well, for the moment, I mean, I can refer to this morning's beautiful talk on the Capuchinic calculation for resonance dynamics in pi n and gamma n, which we heard this morning, and uh, I mean, he covers everything up to two GeV and very well. So, okay, I mean, is it completely crazy to, to yeah. have formation zones working to turn on for the non-resonant contribution in the resonance region, which is relatively small, but increasingly you get in the area? For the non-resonant contribution yeah. like in the resonance region. And now, if you want to introduce a parameter for the background term, how that? You said no, can't do that? seven or eight plots or data comparisons that are most relevant at our energy ranges. We can do the you know the simulations with all of our generators. Yeah, I think the ultimate book on the nuclear fire data dynamics is Eric's advice, which covers the resonance regions and that's the Based on the data, so I would like to be able to <laughs> run our generators against that data. But you should propagate the resonance. 